Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman McIntyre, and uh, thanks to the county board members and to all who come here uh, this morning. Uh, it is great to be welcomed back to Bloomington. Always great to be back here. Uh, Leader Dan Brady, always good to be with you and to join together to celebrate the impact of this bipartisan major bill. Uh, when I became governor three years ago, Illinois had not passed a capital bill for almost a decade. Think about the effect that deteriorating roads and bridges and airports have on our prospects for future growth. When your infrastructure is crumbling with no sign of any major improvement, businesses looking to relocate here, and families thinking about where they want to raise their children, had good reason to be wary about putting down roots in the state of Illinois. So I knew that we had to change that, and we did. We passed and signed the largest infrastructure investment package anywhere in the nation. Today, two and a half years later, two and a half years after I signed this bill into law, Rebuild Illinois has repaired and replaced over 3,500 miles of roads already and nearly 350 bridges statewide. We've dedicated over $60 million to the Visual Arts Center at ISU, with over $40 million in additional investments around campus. We're investing in Heartland Community College and adding an electric vehicle manufacturing academy there too. Rebuild Illinois is replacing the Oak Street water main in Normal, rehabbing the Central Illinois Regional Airport and enhancing transit throughout the Blono region and across McLean County. And on top of all of that, through our $1.5 billion program to support municipal and county projects, Rebuild Illinois has deployed $17.5 million to dozens of projects right here in McLean County alone, including the construction of a wider and safer Meadows Road uh, kicking off next month. Meadows Road and County Highway 23, what the chairman was talking about, was originally built almost 100 years ago. It's a vital north-south throughway for central Illinois and for its economy, fostering access to multiple prairie central uh, uh, facilities and uh, the Blooming Grove wind turbines and Illinois State University farm. It's due for an upgrade after 100 years, that's for sure. And thanks in part to a $4 million investment from Rebuild Illinois, McLean County has the resources that it needs to get the job done. What's more, this funding helps the county reallocate precious local dollars for other parts of the community and other needs that families and businesses have, and perhaps critical savings for local taxpayers, too. This is the kind of project whose importance goes unnoticed by folks who don't live here, but it's at the heart and soul of Rebuild Illinois. Modernizing major throughways that underpin our status as a logistics hub for the nation, that's critical work, but so too are the changes that most directly touch working families and their lives. Upgrading local roads, improving bike paths, Replacing storm drains and widening sidewalks, these are the projects that sustain and revitalize communities. That's why today I'm very excited to announce the next $250 million in support for municipal and county projects. With these new funds, we are helping to build projects like Meadows Road in every corner of Illinois, spurring more economic development across our state. In this work, we owe a real debt of gratitude to the great men and women of organized labor who will make the rebuilding of Meadows Road possible, and to the many other people behind the scenes, not to mention the great team of transportation professionals here in the county and as part of the Illinois Department of Transportation. So with that, I get to introduce our terrific leader of our Illinois Department of Transportation, Secretary of Transportation, Omar Osman. Thank you, Governor, and good morning, everyone. And thank you, uh, Governor, for mentioning the 
men and women of IDAT, a lot of whom are here. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, McLean County and the elected representative joining us today. But I want to acknowledge um, road construction. I think uh, Mike Gulkin is here. Road construction is going to be the contractor on this project. And I also want to acknowledge a good friend of mine. His name is Shane Larson. Uh, he is one of the uh, leaders of Hutchinson Engineering who did the uh, design work here. And of course, everybody talks about Jerry, who is a good friend of all of us. Um, we will truly thank you for what you do for the residents of these counties. Uh, with me here today, uh, with the Illinois Department of Transportation, is the Director of Highways Chief Engineer, Steve Travia. And of course, we are here in District 6, the home of Council Garnett. He's the regional engineer, and I think he's got uh, Brian uh, Trick, who the uh, local roads engineer in District 5, uh, rather not District 6, District 5. Uh, here with him. So thank you all for what you guys do uh, for all of us. Um, so since Rebuild Illinois passed almost three years ago, I have had the privilege of joining the governor at events like this throughout the state to celebrate the achievements of once-in-a-lifetime capital program. I'm especially happy today because we are highlighting a project that's being done by one of our local partners. As far as I'm concerned, and I have said this repeatedly, there is no such a thing as a federal road, a state road, a county road, or a township road at IDAP. They are all Illinois roads and parts of a multimodal that gives our state it is competitive edge and connects us to the rest of the world. Whether you are commuter in Newark, driving a family, driving to a family event, or making a delivery for a business. You are depending on all kinds of roads. It is just part of our transportation system if just one part of our transportation system is not. And instead of good repair, that impacts your quality of life. Thanks to the leadership and vision of Governor Prisker, and the General Assembly, Rebuild Illinois, invest in our local transportation system like never before, and I have been around for a long, long time. This $250 million in installment is the fifth of six, there's one more to come, hopefully this summer, that will be delivered to our counties, townships, and municipalities. Funding from the previous four $250 million in installments already has supported an estimated 2,300 uh, 2, projects across the state. Projects that once faced an uncertain future are creating good paying jobs and thank you uh, for, for the trade. Uh, Mr. Penn, I have seen you early, earlier. Thank you for being here. Good paying jo jobs in our communities uh, enhancing our qualities of life. And all of this is on top of the increased funding our local governments are receiving through their regular allotment. Since Rebuild Illinois passed, almost an additional one billion has been provided to counties, townships, and municipalities in increased motor fuel tax revenues. Add it, add it all up and we are making infrastructure investment across the state that are making our roads and bridges safer and will keep Illinois competitive at the country's transportation hub for a long, long time. Congratulations, Jerry. I know the governor mentioned it. Like I was saying earlier, you're getting a 50% discount on this project. It's eight million. It's eight million. It's not even Black Friday yet, so you're getting, you're getting, you're getting a 50% congratulations. To McLean County, this project is going to make a big, big difference for this area. And I truly look forward to coming back here one day for a ribbon cutting. Thank you, everyone. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Representative Don Brady. Representative, thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Governor Pritzker, thank you, and thank you for being here. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here as well. Uh, Coach McIntyre, Chairman McIntyre, thank you. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, Coach McIntyre was my coach in high school and uh, teacher, and his wife, Karen, who's in the audience here, was the theater coach at Central Catholic High School and, and told me, whatever you do, don't go into politics, Dan. So <laughs> you know how well I listen. But, you know, this is a partnership, and I, I don't think anyone in this room uh, would, uh, would not notice the condition of our roads right now and the type of uh, environment we're in weather-wise and the repairs and the needs across the state, not only here in McLean County. But those of you that are in this room today um, are an example of what a partnership is, and many that will be outside of this room working on this project, the expansion and what's needed on the Middles Road, which is in my legislative district. It's a partnership, obviously, with government from different levels of county uh, to state, and it's a partnership with the governor and the administration and the Illinois General Assembly to come together on a capital bill to make these type of projects a reality. Now, the over $4 million that will be part from the state in this project is sorely needed to close the gap and bring this project together. So with that partnership, we're able to do things like that that people just take for granted that think these type of projects just happen. We all know better. We all know it takes planning. We all know it takes funding. We all know it takes cooperation. We all know it takes a partnership for people to be able to drive roads, to be safe, and to have good jobs, paying jobs across the state. So thank you again, Governor, for being here. Mr. Secretary, Chairman McIntyre, and to all of you here that will make this project a reality and continue on other projects of our infrastructure needs across the state of Illinois. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions from members of the media. I have a question that's not roads and bridges, unfortunately. Um, we've had a pretty tragic death in the community. A seven-month-old baby died what seems like in an accident at home, but her mother had had several contacts with DCFS prior to that incident. Um, the baby's body has yet to be recovered. It's, it couldn't be sadder. So my question is, what can we do in the state to amp up the services of DCFS to make sure that these children don't fall through the cracks? I'm glad you asked. This is um, a subject matter area that I uh, care a lot about. I've been involved with early childhood um, education and um, nutrition and making sure that we're taking care of our youngest and most vulnerable children for a couple of decades. And so when I came into office, I saw that the conditions at DCFS were depleted significantly. Um, I would even use the word decimated uh, as a result of a couple of years without a budget in the state of Illinois, as well as just overall neglect of the agency. We brought new people in. We brought uh, the University of Chicago and Chapin Hall, a really great organization that focuses on child welfare. Uh, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which is another nationally recognized organization, and kind of uh, we put our arms around the agency and said, what needs to happen here to make sure that we're protecting the children that are under the care of DCFS as well as anybody that comes into contact? And what we found was there was years of work that needed to be done. One was we had to retrain all the staff and have done that, by the way. These are folks that um, had worked at the agency sometimes 25 years, and they just hadn't received up-to-date training or maybe never got training. And so we've trained everybody, including all the managers and all the way up to the director of the agency. Uh, then we, I'm sorry to go on about this, but this is something I care deeply about and that we've done a lot of work um, in. Uh, another area is that we have, um, children who come in contact with DCFS who are left in the care of a responsible parent, but sometimes the responsible parent makes decisions for the child while they're in their care that put the child in danger in some ways. That the DCFS could not know when they chose the responsible parent to take care of the child. These are awful circumstances. I think that maybe, I don't know exactly which case you're referring to, but maybe one of those circumstances. Um, DCFS needs to, look, judgments need to be made um, by investigators um, and those who are frontline at DCFS. And that means you've got to hire good people, more people. They've got to have fewer cases per caseworker. 
Um, and that's what we've been doing. We've been hiring and hiring and hiring. Every budget that I have proposed has increased funding and put requirements on DCFS to hire more people and make sure that they're trained to do their job. So apologize for the long-winded answer, but it's something that, that we're still working on. There is much more to do, and there will never be a situation in which we should be satisfied. On the other hand, I think we should recognize progress. I'll give you one area of, of major progress for DCFS, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, the hotline. When I came into office, so the way that DCFS finds out about neglect and abuse, for the most part, is through a hotline. And we have people who answer those hotline calls. When I came into office, only about 50% of those calls were being answered on the spot. And the other 50% were going into voicemail. And then sometimes responded to after days or even weeks. Now, think about that. If there's a case where there's real abuse taking place, you want to act quickly. So this is something that needed to be dealt with. The agency took it on and has managed now to completely overhaul that hotline so that 99% of the calls that come into that hotline now get answered on the spot. And about 1% are uh, maybe uh, put into voicemail that gets responded to within 24 or 48 hours. So that's a tremendous change. It means that we're able to get on those cases as fast as possible. Also, change in hours of when those workers are answering those phones. So most of the cases, the plurality of the cases come through teachers who the, uh, spot abuse or neglect at school. And so when do teachers report? They typically report after school. They can't do it during school hours. They're just too busy. And so between 3 and 6 o'clock, roughly, is when many teachers will call the hotline. Uh, th we had to change the scheduling of workers, right? Because if you have everybody working from 8 to 4 or 9 to 5, you're going to miss some of those, the bulk of calls that come in during the week. So that's something we upgraded, improved, and has led to the um, significant improvements at the hotline. Yes, sir. And can the state gas tax be rolled back? So we need to do everything we can to try to bring down the costs that people are incurring now as a result of inflation. And you know, worldwide global uh, gas prices have gone through the roof, and it's not an Illinois-specific pr problem. This is literally every country in the world is experiencing this, and every state in the United States. So relief can come in two ways. One is by alleviating... Uh, the pressure on gas tax here in the state of Illinois, as well as at the federal level, there are things that can be done to try to bring down the cost of oil overall, importing of oil to the United States. We should be working on all of those things because families are suffering from not only the increased price of, of oil, but other uh, inflationary uh, price rises. So I know that the Hotel Industry uh, uh, Association in Illinois is asking for a, I think $250 million is what they were asking for. The legislature is considering that. Um, it's something that, you know, we've tried to help small businesses and businesses throughout the state of Illinois to recover from the pandemic and the effects on their businesses. Hotels have suffered as much as anybody, maybe even more. Uh, and there are low-wage workers, relatively low-wage minimum wage workers. I'm glad we raised the minimum wage, so at least that minimum wage is becoming a living wage. But, um, but there are many low-wage workers that are severely affected by the downturn in the hotel business. So um, that's something that the legislature is considering now, and certainly I'm you know, in favor of helping businesses that have suffered through the pandemic. Yes, sir. Uh, only because they don't get taken up by the committee that's supposed to take those up. So, you know, we're at the whim of the Senate and their decision about uh, whether to take up um, and when to take up uh, proposed members. With the higher gas prices, will this maybe amp up the state's infrastructure for electric cars to make sure that gets built so that people might buy more electric cars? Yeah, I, you know, look, the rise in gas prices is a very unfortunate thing. Um, I guess if you could find any silver lining, it might be that people will 
more likely choose when they're going to buy a new car to go to electric because it's much, much less expensive uh, over the long haul of ownership. Uh, so I do think that there will be an increased uh, number of purchases of vehicles, electric vehicles, and I hope that people will purchase vehicles that are made in the state of Illinois. Um, that certainly would benefit all of us. Uh, and, and we're trying to attract even more uh, electric vehicle manufacturers. We've got two major ones uh, in Rivian and in Lion Electric. Uh, but believe me, I've been on the phone with many, many uh, companies around the country, and uh, everybody is looking to ramp up their manufacturing of electric vehicles, and I want them to do it here. We have the best labor in the entire country. Uh, we have a lower cost of living for uh, workers and for executives who want to, if they want to move their headquarters here. Uh, and we have a bill in place to provide incentives for those companies to come here so that they can, we can be competitive with any other state in the country. No, the state of Illinois is not doing enough. Um, there is, I, I want to be clear that, that uh, our, we're providing funds. We've provided funds every year in my budget. Uh, is it ever enough? I'm not sure that that's ever enough. Um, are there more resources that we could provide? In other words, to protect people both who are experiencing um, domestic violence, sexual abuse also, um, for people to be able to, to find a place to leave and go to and be protected, that's something we need to build up more capacity for. Uh, not to mention there are uh, tremendous challenges that people, once they've left a bad situation of domestic violence, they need help sometimes to find a job. Maybe it's somebody who's never had a job before. They're, they've been married, didn't have a job before. They have their kids with them in tow. We've got to protect that whole family and help them get on their feet so that they can ha live independently, get a job, get an apartment, and so on. They need more than just a place to go. And by the way, there are great organizations across the state that do this work. They just need more. Thank you. Thank you.